great to see so many people here. We actually called our meeting to order before at 5.30, so we are already in session. Um, and I just want to quickly ask if there are any agenda revisions. Um, and any public comments other than access to course chemistry or the Black Lives Matter? Are there any other public comments? I'd like to bring up special education. Right. <clears throat> At a future meeting, my son would actually like to speak. Will you introduce yourself? Sure. <laughs> I'm Yvonne Crouch. My son is Tyler Crouch, a freshman here at U32. And we would like to discuss accessibility here at U32 and some of the problems that we're having and how can we work with everyone to get this accomplished. Say it again, discuss accessibility and challenges. Challenges. So when you say when you say accessibility, do you mean like in the physical space, moving through the building? Exactly. Yeah. Being able to go to the bathroom by yourself. Okay. Um, not having, I mean, we already know there's water issues in the parking lot. Um, that needs to be looked at every day because not only do we have water issues, but there is a major divot. And if I don't walk my son across that every day, he's going to fall. Um, we have some major challenges here, and we need to work together to get these figured out and make it accessible for all. Have you spoken to the administration? Yes. Okay. I had a coffee with Yvonne um, yesterday. Yesterday. And, <laughs> and she had a very interesting suggestion that um, a, a board member and an administrator spend the day in a wheelchair around just to just a certain experience the, you know, the, the physical reality of what is in life. Um, I'm not sort of a folk thing. <laughs> if someone could even spend an hour, and it needs to include being in the parking lot, getting into the school, trying to get lunch in the cafeteria, trying to go to the bathroom by themselves, an hour would be all it would take to, to follow my son around to understand what we're talking about in a manual wheelchair, not an electric wheelchair, too. Thank you. Anybody else? I'm going to skip our consent agenda. I'm going to come back to it um, in deference to you guys. And let's start with the um, access to course section. And I understand that there's some ninth grade, nope, sorry, there's some eighth grade students who are hoping that they can enroll in chemistry in ninth grade along with biology. And I, I think there's some people that want to talk to us. Hey, come on, just come on right up so we can see you over here. Hi, my name is Sunday Popper and I'm currently an eighth grader here. Um, I've been taking ninth grade science this year along with about 10 other students and I've really loved taking it. it it's made my year so much better. And um, I really love science and I really wanted to accelerate my learning by taking bio and chemistry <coughs> next year. Um, however, when I was and when I asked to try to take these, I was told that I couldn't and I was extremely frustrated. Um, as of right now, with my schedule for next year that we're sort of planning out, I have two free bands, so I could get chemistry very easily into those spots, but I, without these bands, I won't be a fully enrolled student. Um, and I, unless I can find one other STEM bank class, and there really aren't many for ninth graders. Um, in seventh grade, I took I went on class through Johns Hopkins, and it was called Crafting the Essay. It was for writing. It was, it was amazing. And um, when I tried to take that class, I got tons of pushback saying that I already had a writing class in school, so I didn't need to take it. And now I find when I'm trying to take a harder class next year, I'm told to take an online class, which is making me I, I'm frustrated, and I don't know why. So 
I, if I can't take chemistry next year, I'll have to take it online, and it's definitely a more isolated and stressful way of learning, and so I'll hope you take my requests to take chemistry next year. Uh, hello, my name is Oliver Hansen, and I'm an eighth grader. Um, I'm an avid mountain biker, cross country runner, and Nordic skier, but I'm also a very avid learner. And I am here because I care about my education, and I'm interested in taking bio and chem next year. Um, and I know it will be a lot of hard work, but that's also why I want to do it. Um, another reason I want to do it is because it may open up spaces in my senior year to take college credit classes and possibly do the VAST program. Um, and I know that the scheduling out of the norm can be a hassle, but this is also like my education. I, I want to feel the challenge in order to be prepared for um, college and after college and in my career. Um, and currently I'm also taking Algebra 1 and Earth Science. Um, and I guess uh, algebra is the only one that's really providing a challenge to me and it's also making the class a lot more exciting because it's making me come up with new ideas and solutions to problems um, and it's just livening up my second semester um, and with challenges I also feel that I'm more engaged and I am more, I feel like the classes that provide challenges are more meaningful for my education. And yeah, um, thanks for your time, and I hope that you take what we said into consideration. Um, so I. Um this is actually a nice idea that I am wanting to support her. Um, my point, most important point, is that um, numbers of students enrolling in courses is always somewhat in flux. There'll be families who move out over the summer, there'll be families who move in, and if four families were to move in, um, maybe one from Orange, one from out of state, um, somebody coming from Montpelier who um, 11th graders who wanted to take advanced chemistry, they would never, ever be told that there were no longer spots for them in chemistry. Similarly, there are several kids who worked ahead in 10th grade who were ready for advanced chem and um, worked ahead in 9th grade to take 10th grade science and now in 10th are ready to take 11th grade advanced chemistry. I don't believe that those children would be told that that was not allowed either. And that leads me to believe that the only reason these four kids can't is uh, because they're in ninth grade, which is not following along with um, the huge effort that everybody has put in towards proficiency-based learning. It's really proficient. The kids are ready for it. It's algebra one is the level of math in advanced chemistry. They can do this work. They were, um, at least Maeve, I checked with the instructor, there's no problem there, and I know that other science instructors have, um, have been supportive as well. Um, I, one of the arguments against this by the administration is that they don't know what the kids would then take sophomore year. Um, I, I don't think that's valid. The issue is we need classes for freshman year. All of these kids have two free bands plenty of room for chemistry and chem lab. We can figure out sophomore year, um, I actually wrote a long email to the parents involved, um, it's going to be very complicated sophomore year if we uh, can't figure this out now. So they could take anatomy and physiology, the prereq is advanced chem and bio, they would fill those prereqs, they could take that sophomore year, they could take a programming class, they could probably go to CCB, um, and we could coordinate. I don't I wouldn't do that in ninth grade, but that's certainly feasible in tenth grade. Um, when Maeve's oldest brother, Charlie, was in eighth grade, 
um, laying out his coursework for four years would have not been meaningful because we didn't have AP classes when Charlie was in eighth grade. AP classes didn't show up until Charlie was in 11th grade. So I think there's plenty of time to figure out sophomore year. Um, what Maeve would like is challenge freshman year. Um, my last point is that ninth grade and 10th grade, at least ninth grade, I'll stick with that, um, have actually become somewhat um, less challenging um, in the last few years. Ninth and 10th grade are now working um, with a core format where uh, there's less tracking, both in the science and the math, actually all of the academic classes. Um, bio has been removed from the advanced bio class. And so her eight classes, she has a math class, a bio, which is manageable for her. Um, global studies uh, is not uh, as challenging as it could be. PE and the language class. And there is simply plenty of room for her to take this on. So I don't think this is a student issue. I understand the argument about a space issue, but it wouldn't have been denied to any 11th and 10th graders. So school committed to excellence, proficiency-based learning, I think this is something that should happen. Thanks. <clears throat> Hi, my name's Amy. I'm Oliver's mom. As well, I'm here to see Oliver expressing interest um, really challenging himself in school. And um, I do believe in the ability for the school to provide strong STEM classes for those people who want to have that path, especially as they're moving into college and pursuing that um, area. But I also feel like I'm kind of going to talk about it more as a broader lens with a broader perspective. Um, I have kids who are excited to learn physically and mentally, um, academically and creatively. And he's eager to challenge himself to see what he's capable of. And currently he's testing some skills around planning ahead and being proactive about his education and formulating his thoughts around this and being able to speak to adults about it and actually move towards something that he wants. And I think those are great skills for any teenager to be actually practicing right now, um, currently and also for their life. And Oliver's interest in doubling up um, isn't just to provide flexibility in the senior year he would want to take college level classes because the path he continues to want to go down, but it also means that his educational experience will be more meaningful. And when it's more meaningful, you learn more and you're more engaged. Um, I also think, think that it makes sense for students to be able to have an opportunity to challenge themselves and to know what it's like to work really hard. And that's going to be different for every student, what that means and what that looks like. And I think it's also important, maybe even for the potential to fail, to take on something that might be too hard so that they know what it's like to learn how to be a student. And so they know what it might be like to fail and have to get back on the way in and try again now rather than as a freshman in college when they're on their own for the first time, navigating a much harder course load and trying to figure it all out. Um, also, at a time when brain development is literally like pulling kids to wanting to take more risks, to wanting that desire to fit in, and at a time where they're being exposed to technology that is a helpful tool, but I also feel that it's a tremendous experiment on our youth about in learning how to interact with other people and for themselves. and that there's, and they're at a time of their brain development where if they're exposed to substances, there's more chance for addiction. So at this time, when all of those things are just literally happening physiologically in their bodies, if there's interest in wanting to have an engaged, um, excited desire to learn and excel, I really feel like that's a healthy way to help kind of meet some of the other challenges that they're going to have to navigate at this time in their life. And it's a healthy way to do it. Um, so while I am hoping that the decision to not allow advanced chem and bio combo for 9th graders next year will be reconsidered, 
I'm actually more important and interested in the conversation of how can U32 provide more opportunities for students who do have this academic drive to really kind of see what they've got and are preparing for what they think they want to do in college, knowing that that might change. Um, but how can that be allowed to prepare them to be fully, proactively, vibrantly engaged in their education and you know, moving forward in life? So I thank you for listening to what we all have to say and to also taking into consideration what the students themselves are saying and that they actually want to learn more. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Is there anybody else hiding back there? <laughs> okay. No, two of the students couldn't um, come. There are actually four who are making this appeal. Um, and my sort of follow-up is, should this not be reversed, we would like the administration to tell us what STEM classes, what STEM choices these kids have, because we couldn't find any. And it would be hundreds of dollars, if not over a thousand, to find that chemistry class um, somehow, somewhere, in, and under a, a much less desirable learning environment. When the same class is actually being taught in the building probably four or five times a day. Can I read my stepdaughter's here? Of course. <laughs> so my daughter Ella couldn't be here tonight, but she, uh, she writes this. Hello, my name is Ella Bradley, and I'm taking one. I'm one of the eighth graders who are signed up who signed up to take advanced chemistry next year. I believe I should have the opportunity to take, to take this course for three reasons. First, I am taking physical earth science currently, and I like it, but it is not challenging. Second, I started taking physical earth science with the purpose of getting ahead in STEM classes, and not being able to take advanced chemistry would lessen the purpose of taking physical earth science. Third, our proficiency system is based around students having the opportunity to take classes that challenge and are proficient in. Uh, regardless of grade level. I hope you will let me take this advanced course because it will challenge me and allow me to get ahead in my studies. Thank you. Thank you. Are we discussing this now? We are. I was just wondering if you have information for us also. We're absolutely discussing it. So, uh, uh, yes. I would uh, I'd like to start with one of the one of the reasons that we've cited as administration is that the um, that the courses are larger um, this year, and it is it is partially a resource issue. Um, we have not had freshmen take chemistry in the past. Typically, chemistry is taken concurrently with algebra two um, as the course, and um, or algebra two is taken prior to chemistry. Um, and so that's one of the other pieces. But um, this year we currently have 49 students in our CP chemistry, our college prep chemistry. Uh, next year we have 59. In our advanced chemistry this year we have 58 students, 10 of which are sophomores. Next year we'll have 85 students, 36 of which are sophomores. And in our Chem 2 class, we have 21 students this year, and we'll have 24 students next year. So I do understand that four students does not seem like a large number, but we've already expanded our classes. Um, there are over 20 students per class in a laboratory class. Um, and we are, at this moment in time, we don't know that we have a certified teacher to be able to teach one of the lab sections of the class in order to make this all run. So we have uh, one of our teachers who, um, <coughs> who resigned, uh, Pauline Cheeseman, was chemistry and physics, and she was going to be stepping in to help us with the lab sections that we have current, uh, that we would need next year. And so all of our certified chemistry teachers, we have already booked them to their limit, and we are still in need of chemistry support. And so for that read, that was one of the reasons that we, we <coughs> certainly said that, that freshmen were not going to be put in this course um, as a dual enrollment. Um, we have asked that our school counselors and the TAs of these students uh, sit down and help create that four-year plan um, so that they can see when things can be taken and when they're available. I would offer that those free bands are times where other course requirements might be able to, or proficiency requirements might be able to be, um, be taken care of in their freshman year so that it would free up space um, in subsequent years for them to, to take courses. 
I can't speak specifically to any one of them. I haven't done the four-year plan with any of these students. That's something that their TA and their school counselor would work on. Um, and so um, I would just say I understand a desire. I think there is, um, I think it's a little unfair to say that the freshman year is easier or anything like that. I think that we are constantly striving to increase the rigor and the relevance of our classrooms. Um, and I do know that there have been, in the past, that there have been reputations for some of these courses as being um, easy. Um, but most of our students who have accelerated in the science uh, program of studies would be taking biology in their freshman year and chemistry, advanced chemistry, in their sophomore year. And that's where we see the 36 sophomores next year taking um, the advanced chemistry class. So I thought I, um, I understood Michelle also to ask if, if there isn't the possibility for them to take advanced chemistry, what other options are there well, in the STEM area? So, so I mean, there are, <laughs> that's hard to say. I mean, we don't necessarily have a whole lot of options in the freshman year. I mean, I think that that's a, that's a valid point for us. I mean, if you recall back when we, we looked at our studies and kind of what the programs look like if you accelerate um, more of the opportunities for ex for multiple classes come in here in 11th and 12th grade years of, uh, of science because the uh, chemistry it's usually a biology freshman year chemistry um, 10th grade year and then it would be chemistry 2 um, AP physics AP bio computer science, those courses fall more into the junior and senior years in terms of an accelerated course, coursework, is what we showed previously. So there's there's not as many options. I mean, I understand that, but I also don't know what options. Um, some of our school counselors, there are VTVLC courses, online courses that may or may not be chemistry, um, that are science courses. Um, but I even have a, a, a question on here I'm not sure the answer of is um, can students do uh, CCV in their sophomore year? And I'm not sure that they can even that. So um, I, I, that's a question that I would have to go get an answer. And so um, I'm not sure that they, CCV does sophomores. Um, well, they usually, if we think about the dual enrollment with Vermont, that's open to the <coughs> agency in Vermont, yeah. by the way. That, uh, Act 77 apply that plus the pathway. Did you say the number again? Did you say 36? 36 sophomores will be taking um, advanced chemistry next year. Okay. 10 took it this year. Okay. And is it, but it's normally a junior level class, right? Correct. So, so the remainder of those seats are primarily juniors with. A, Two or three seniors. I can so look how many how many in total are you anticipating? Just to in advanced chemistry? Yes. Eighty-five students. And that's how many sections? That is four sections. Is there any possibility to considering the demand to create another section? Uh, that would be nice, but I don't have a teacher to fill that yeah. section. We're already searching for a teacher to take care of the one lab section. Let me help just for the board. Science is one of those areas where you're not, you can have a general certification, but especially in the advanced sciences, you have to have certification for that subject area. Vermont, Vermont has not, um, so you need to have a chemistry physics certification. So presently, you still don't have a lab cover. Correct. So you need to hire a physics and chemistry teacher to try to cover what we have needs for now. Because we had this is a uh, Randy. Um, his leave of absence was for physics. Uh, we happened to have hired someone who was physics and chemistry, um, but she is moving out of state. Our long-term sub is moving out of state. And so we're searching for someone to teach physics, and if possible, take a section of chemistry. But that's a, I have to admit, that's a long shot um, in terms of getting a one-year appointment to take either one of those subject areas. Does Bill feel like moonlighting? Well, my, he does. <laughs> well, my, 
No, in season three, many times, I wish I was back to where I was, but I do not hold those endorsements anymore. And I have said this very publicly. I said this, I said this just the other day to one of our science teachers. I said, I taught AP physics. I don't think there's any way I can even get in to back to a, a, what we used to call when I was teaching a freshman level physics because I just, it's not there anymore. Okay. Like writing a yeah. <laughs> if, the, if the primary rationale for this decision is, is the course, the section <coughs> section, do you think that if, uh, if we had lower numbers, you would have come in this request? I would still be hesitant. Um, and, and I would go back to the, one of the first reasons I said is that typically the chemistry and algebra 2 um, it's not necessarily a prerequisite, but a co-requisite. You know, they're typically taken together, or algebra two is taken before. So, what math will eighth graders be taking in ninth grade? So, this group will be taking geometry um, with um, yes. algebra two. And then algebra two is the following year. Correct, Michelle. So, when we approached Mark about it, he said absolutely, the math in this advanced chemistry class is algebra one. It's algebra one, and he thought it would be just fine. And and there aren't STEM options in ninth grade. I mean, it, it just and I I does feel like the ninth grade class work is fairly light. Lucy, um, yeah, you just bring up the math thing. I took chem as a sophomore, and I was in geometry at the time, and it wasn't a problem. I understand that it's taking the algebra to I was able to. Do you guys have thoughts on this? Opinions? Well, to me, it feels like as someone who's been in bio and chemistry, chemistry is, I mean, it's a difficult class, and it's even more difficult when there's too many students in the class. Because it's a mastery class, you need that attention from your teacher. And there'd be times where we'd have work time, and like Mark would have a pile of quizzes this big, and he could not get through them. And it's like, it's one of those things, if you open the door, then in coming years, like, how are we going to accommodate if there's more, you know, more freshmen and more that want to take this class? Um, but I feel like, I mean, there, for me personally, even if I do feel like a uh, course load is light, there's always been more challenging options if I ask or if I seek them out. Teachers are usually willing to accommodate extra work or extra projects for extra work. So, so, the, so you felt like class size matters? Do you yes. remember how many were in your class? About? It was a big class. I think we definitely had 20 or more. 20s. Yeah, I was, yeah. I was in a big class too, and I had a similar experience in that it was just hard to get help, and a lot of kids sort of fell through the cracks just because so many people were in chemistry, and there just wasn't enough. But the teacher could sort of help with that. So I, I would add that this year our number of advanced chem <coughs> students is actually the lowest that it's been in um, the last five. We've typically averaged between 60, well, we've, we've gone between 62 and 66 kids in the advanced chem class. So that more than 20 kids because we were running three sections of it. Um, so now you're days. running four sections. And now we're going to have to, yeah, we're going to run four sections of advanced chem and three sections of the CP chem and one section of chem two. Yeah. And that's with labs as well. So those, we should always remember that with each one of these classes, there's also a lab class that goes with it. Yeah, I know the logistics are, are a, constraining factor. But um, in a general rule, if there are kids who want to want who are really eager to to learn and to um, to study more, to, to know more, um, it would be great to try to do everything possible to accommodate that and to you know generate that interest and, and, and stoke it um, as much as possible. Because it, it, not just for them, I think it's it's good for the entire school because it, there's an energy that comes out of it that is um, infectious in a good way. Um, and 
and there's always uh, I'm always concerned that um, you know if parents have the wherewithal to do this, if they feel that their kids aren't getting what they really need, that they'll you know put them out and go to someone else, which uh, would be you know I think a real loss on their own. Um, so. Anyway, um, I, I, I know, I, I don't wish to minimize the, the difficulty of, of trying to figure it out. I know for my, speaking for myself, that if you need to spend more money, I mean, obviously within reason, but um, I, would, I would support it for something like this, absolutely. I understand, but we already have the money set aside for a teacher that we don't have hired yet. Yeah. That's, I mean, so that's, I mean, like, there's <coughs> this, yeah. I, I just need to add this. Being a physics chem teacher, I can go get a job tomorrow. Because there's openings that can't get filled. We're going to have our, we're having our time just getting our physics. So you would all have a teacher for the students you have now. Correct. So it's a it's a huge problem whether you add four more kids to it or not. Correct. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think our assumption is you're you're going to fill that position, right, yeah, one way or another. Right. Yeah. You're yeah. Do that. My goal. Yeah. Yeah. So that I, I feel like honestly that that's a separate. Yeah. I understand. Okay. I pulled out the program studies because I was just kind of curious about the whole pathway and all the courses. And I read your letter at the beginning, and I won't read it all, but there is, it says the program of studies is one of many tools that will help you plan for success in college. This is to the students and career. With help from your TA teachers, counselors, and administrators, you should be choosing courses that challenge you and provide a broad range of experiences. U32 strives to provide an inspiring experience that includes strong core courses and a broad offering of elective courses. It's my hope that you'll take advantage of multiple pathways and U32 has to offer early college, AP courses, community-based learning, and branching out programs. At U32, we expect every student to strive for the highest levels of, of achievement socially and academically, which I agree with 100%. It's beautiful. And it's right there. <laughs> Very well written. Um, so I'm torn, too. I get, I get the logistics of it. My goal on this board has been to challenge every child here, and I can't tell you how many people have come to me over the way too many years I've been here and say, it's not hard enough. I don't have enough challenge. And to see four eighth graders, especially a boy, and I don't mean to be sexist or anything, but I am thrilled to see an eighth grade boy who is so excited to learn. And I really commend you. I commend all of you. but. That sort of goes right to my heart there. Um, well, it's actually two boys and two girls. And so. Sorry for the other boy. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't come. Um, that was. So, and I, you know, I just feel like we should do everything we can to get kids to rise to the highest level of challenge that they want. And I know it's hard, and I know it's difficult. Um, but I think we've got to figure out a way to help these guys move forward because it's it's going to bring us all up. And make us all better. Oh, uh, Your good. Yeah, um, and, and I can vouch for the. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, for the difficulty in, in setting up a laboratory situation um, and grading lab papers and, and making a laboratory experience a genuine um, so that you can work with, with all your students. Um, and and I, I don't know that I would want to really push more students into an already full lab situation. Um, and I, I think it's a unique situation where we are um, that we're full. Um, and I think that maybe we should look at the timeline and look at the course of studies and look at what other options we have available um, and, and just push it back and, and see where we get before we make this decision. So, well, I, I, I don't know if it is our decision. It's, I don't, yeah. I don't know if it is our, yeah. What would our policies say about this? But, 
Well, I looked for a policy, and the class size policy yeah. is the closest it gets. Um, and it says? It depends on minimum. It actually tells Stephen and I to set those class sizes. And comment once a year. Come once class a year, sizes. we give you the report each year. So we we pretty much set it a minimum for 10. And when we look at the labs, uh, George, my thinking is exactly the same as yours, because I can remember those many nights sitting in the chem lab. And at that point, it wasn't microchem, so it was a lot more chemicals, but it was making solutions and getting things ready. How many lab schools are there? 30. Well, we have, uh, our lab is a, um, is a large, it's a multi-lab uh, room. So it accommodates three classrooms of kids. At the same time? At the same time. One, one class. Yeah, right, right. I've been in there so many times where it's. I don't, yeah, there's always. So, have, so could you have two classes of 25 in there at the same time? Well, you could if you have the teachers. Well, I'm not at, yeah. I was just, yeah. you know. Yeah, you, you can you, have You two physically classes. can, so it's not. It's not, a, that's not, the physical space isn't the limitation. Okay. Yeah. I think, it, I think it comes down to, I, I'm sure you expressed it well. As a, as a teacher, as a former science teacher. Um, and so to finish the class size, we try to maximize the you know, lab science into around 25th with our lab science. And we try to keep our class size at a maximum, but we can go over it in places, in sections of 24. So I'm going to play devil's advocate. Is 22 around 20? It's I'm just, I'm playing devil's advocate. So, so in any scheduling scenario, you're going to have classes that are slightly right. larger and slightly smaller. I remember coming to the algebra sessions so, that work. So can, I, even, can I offer us just at least our first step? I, I don't know that this is a solution, but, um, but at least a first step is that, you know, one of the things that I hear is that we have to find challenges for our students associated with STEM particularly around this ninth grade group. Um, we do not have a lot of options right now, but um, it sounds like it's incumbent on us to figure out what those options might be if we cannot provide for the chemistry um, at this point in time, is what it seems like to me, right? And so, um, so my, I, I think it was, it's incumbent upon us to figure out what, what other things we can offer and what other things we can do, and to try to make that as a first good faith effort in solving this problem. Um, and then, if that does is not solved at that point in time, I'm still answerable to you guys and, and the process that we, we have. You know? I, I would ask us that we have our first, our first option is to make sure that we have the four-year plans for the students that get at least a framework for what they might do and to look at what are some options that we can present as viable options, not just an online course um, for our students. For ninth grade. For ninth grade. Yeah, I would just, um, in, in your effort, ask that it would be very specifically STEM challenge. I'm not interested in maybe taking PE, health, financial literacy, and so on. I'm not interested in the other stuff. She has two hands for a relevant, challenging class, like the one that's already being taught in the building. And it may be that you hire that teacher, and you have four sections, and you do add one student to each of four sections, which would mean you have 21 students, or 22, instead of 20. I mean, I actually think that this will work out quite nicely, um, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm hopeful because Stephen, you and I had talked, and you said there are other, you know, STEM options, and there really aren't other STEM options. So, so let's give the administration a chance to do that. Let's have each of those kids do a four-year plan with their TA and their. So the issue is that that then you, you drop in, you, you don't put chemistry in. No, 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 I'm not. Okay. I, you know, do it both ways. We've done it. Figure it out. Yeah, um, we've done it. But there's you know, nothing for ninth grade. I, I'm hearing Stephen say he's going to try an option, and I think we need to let him do that. He's heard what we've had to say. Um, 
And he said, we can come back if it doesn't work. And I just encourage, echo what you say about keeping kids challenged. We want, we want those kids challenged. And Stephen, if, um, if you feel inspired to, to maybe look at some of your ideas regarding you just, mm -hmm. I know which one you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, I, I think that would be terrific. Okay. Thank you. We now have a whole other group of students. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and you guys came to us last week and spoke about the Black Lives Matter. And you were very passionate about it. Um, and uh, we said we, in order to discuss it, we needed to have it on the agenda, which we do have on the agenda. Um, and I don't know if you want to say anything first. If anybody's prepared to say anything. Um. Do you want, uh, like, would you like Leticia to read, read what she read last week? So, like, uh, do you have it there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. that would be great. Yeah. Uh, people like to hear that. Um, and she's going to be less nervous because she's already done <laughs> um, The Black Lives Matter movement was established four years ago and was built on bringing attention to the violence that was being inflicted on black communities. And it was also built on anti black racism. Throughout the years, it has thrived into focusing on trying to make the world make a world where a black person can be successful economically, socially, and politically. We started BLAM, which is our group, and it stands for Black, Latinas, and many more, uh, for people of different races to come and talk about the struggles that they have because of their race. We talk about the everyday things that are said to us by ignorant people and the looks that we get because we are not white. Racism isn't the biggest problem at E32, but it is a hidden problem. And a lot of the racism that comes, comes from people who just don't understand. So they don't see the harm that they have done. To hang the flag would be to show that we are invested in supporting the movement and making people aware that the very few not white students at U32 also matter. We believe that Montpelier started a big thing by hanging the flag, and we would like to be a part of carrying that on. It's not about someone's life mattering more than anyone else's. It's about my life mattering the same as yours. And so what is your, rec your wish for us um, to have the Black Lives Matter flag come? Every day, all year, for five years, for ten years, have you kind of thought? Uh, I'm just trying to get a sense of where you guys are in this. Well, it would be good to have it hang here for E32 for years. Like, I think that's our goal. Can I say too, um, like, at the group as a whole has like multiple goals in all of this. Part of it is to like, start groups where they speak with students and kind of have their voice heard for really the first time about what it feels like to be a student in this position. And so a big goal is to take time figuring this out and kind of creating these situations and this dialogue in this community and then to raise the flag as a celebration of this community. So it's not to just raise the flag, but to have like all these experiences along with it. Um, I don't know that we've had dialogue about like the idea of time because I know that Montpelier did it for the month of February. Although I think it's still up. So, so uh, just to interject, so it's through the end of the school year. Um, they they revise their piece through the end of the school year, and then it'll apply in subsequent Februarys. Their, the original request that the Montpelier board received was to put the flag up until the American flag represented everyone. Um, they did not, they felt that the metric at the back end of that was a little too complex. <laughs> so, they, so they addressed uh, African American History Month. Uh, the, the board addressed that. The board. That's what they originally targeted. The Burlington High School then put the flag up in solidarity with Montpelier High School, and they put it up till the end of the year, at which point Montpelier agreed to keep theirs up to the end of the year because of that gesture. That's where they're at in terms of how long they're planning to have it up. Thanks. <coughs> and I do have more information from Montpelier. From Montpelier. Yeah. And, and I do as well. Yeah. 
Can I say something? Absolutely. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> having it having it hang here until the end of the school year. Do you want to elaborate? Oh, I could, but I, I don't want to go too far down the road. That I'll get too cranked up, so. <laughs> um, I think it's important to show support for the kids that are coming forward and the kids that care about their own lives and the kids that are seeing things that are happening in this country that are uh, upsetting uh, for them, but for all of us, really. And so... I just think it's, I think it'd be a very significant and important symbol um, to show that we hear what they're saying, we, we share their concerns, and we support them. And can I say too, in regards to, I think one of the things we as a group have talked about is the idea of keeping the voice present, because it's really easy for there to be an experience and then that to kind of fall by the wayside. So it is a really great idea to have this like kind of happening on a yearly thing, like where like maybe there's experiences and the play is raised for a certain amount of time. And I'm sure the ideal would be to have it all the time, but, like, but at least to have it be a reoccurring experience. I just have one more thing too, and I, I mean, I think I like the idea in terms of reoccurring. Black History Month, it should be up. I mean, I, to me, that's a given. As time goes by, so. I'm curious. Are, are you all in touch with the the Black Lives Matter headquarters or wherever they are? Do you have any, any connection with them? Um, not really. Part of the network or anything? No, not really. At yeah. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah. It's okay, Yeah, yeah. But you have had contact with Mafia here and the students who are involved down there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a student thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, personally, there's a Black Lives Matter from my, that I follow on social media, and it's just, it's not like the whole thing, but it's like a Vermont thing, so it's more personal. Than my, that's my little connection to it. Yeah. Um, it's good. I'm, I'm just. The reason I ask is that, um, and I mean, part of the reason why there is a Black Lives Matter movement is because on a depressingly regular basis, um, unarmed black people get shot down by um, people in authority. And the, it, it seems to me that the Black Lives Matter flag is, is very dramatic. I mean, it's, um, well, it's black. <laughs> so it, it has a kind of funereal um, quality to it. And I'm, I'm just, I'm in, favor of, I'm in favor of flying it. What I'm trying to sort of work out is how to make it as, as meaningful a kind of learning experience for, not just for you, I mean, you already know a lot that um, a lot of your classmates may not know, but how to make it um, a learning experience for, for your classmates as well. Um, and you know, in the, this recent incident in Oakland, um, I don't know if it, are you. Um, is there anything? Is there any way that you're connected, or sort of informing your classmates about things that are going on um, in the country? Do you mean like in class? Either in class or in um, I don't know. I guess every now and then you do tell me or some or the middle school does. The middle school does. If yeah. I know like, our class is like dem roots or US history, if something like that happens, we usually have a discussion about it. Like in class like, we talk about it. And sometimes we talk about we could like debate about which side we're on. And so yeah, we do talk about it sometimes. Yeah. Additionally, the eighth grade is going to visit the eighth grade for the first time to 
talk with the students about their experience in connection with their Civil War unit. So civil this is right. like kind of something civil that's I'm sorry, Civil Rights, yeah. <laughs> Not Civil War, Civil Rights. But like this is something like, like the word's getting out and it's really moving forward. That's great. Very good. Yeah. Um, when, when it comes up at our last meeting, sort of raised the, these very good questions about, you know, um, what does this actually mean on a practical daily basis? Um, just put in mind, you know, how, how can we use this to really make it uh, maximize the impact uh, for, um, for students to, to learn the reason why we're putting it up there? Um, and any ideas that, I mean, it's, it's really sort of, you're the most powerful voices for, for that. And um, I don't know, I'd be happy to, to see you come up with something that, um, that really kind of leverages whatever symbolic action we take by putting up a flag to, um, to get the message across in a strong way. Um, we, we have talked about, like, meeting with each class individually and talking to them about race. So we could talk to them also about the flag, what it means to us, what the movement is, like, maybe right before we put up the flag. So it's not like just hanging it up so people see it and then talking to them after, like, explaining what it is and what it means before we put it up. Yeah, that's great. And, um, not this stuff. I sort of got a lot. <laughs> sort of complex mess of stuff. So maybe. I, don't know, I just thought. Well, uh, maybe this could be up to this. But what I was asking last week is <coughs> how are we going to um, think about the next request? For, to, to fly a flag. What is the criteria that we're going to use? If you've got some information about what the other schools are doing. I can speak somewhat to Montpelier's situation and what they've done. Can I interrupt for just a second? Sure. So I don't know if you understand that. When we make decisions as a board, we base a lot of it on the policy that we have. And so we always need to think about which policy we're thinking about, or if we need a new policy, or or the ramifications of doing something on a policy. So that's kind of what we're talking about. If we do this, where, what might we have to consider, and do we have the criteria in order to make a fair judgment? Yeah. Um, Stephen, you said you had some info too. Yeah, I, I think I yours, if I say if Yeah, I think yours is going to be more specific to what the board decided. Mine's more around what administration and teachers uh, dealt with. I bet there's overlap. For me. Yeah, there probably is. Yeah. Um, Montpelier currently has. A sort of request for input out to the attorney, state's attorney general. As of Sunday, they hadn't heard back fully from him. They got some information from the attorney general's office, but not um, As I, I told you about the original request, um, they had decided, they learned, A, one of the things they believe they learned, and I don't know how written in stone this is, that there's definitely some difference between what the attorney general's office and what their school lawyer felt were issues. Um, and that's the question of whether the flagpole is a public forum or not. And that's sort of where, that's sort of the linchpin of, of what they're concerned with. Um, they got the information, Julio Thompson, the Assistant Attorney General of Vermont, shared the following with them so far, that the flagpole that the flagpole will be used to fly the Black Lives Matter flag is used solely by the district and is not a public forum. So the Attorney General seems to feel that the flagpole is at the discretion of the board. We could, there's also the possibility that depending on how we handle it, we could define it as a public forum. And that would change, that then we would need a policy in place as to how to deal with different requests. Montpelier has been flooded with other requests of flags to put up since they did this. Um, many of which are 
almost an antithesis, not, not strictly an antithesis, but definitely ch challenging political issues have been brought to them. Um, so really, it, it appears that the Attorney General thinks the flagpole is ours to decide what to do with, and that we could maintain it that way if we choose to. Um, maybe Montpelier School's attorney isn't sure they, that they agree with that. Um, they both said that if it is open to student groups to decide to submit stuff to it, then the district can't control what goes up. It would have to go through the process that we set up for student groups to do that. But we, at our discretion, it looks like currently could make a choice to put on it what we want to. Um, there was a little confusion at Montpelier when the whole process started in that a lot of the folks involved thought that the three flags out by the road were the flags they were talking about. They had, at the entrance to Montpelier's driveway is a Vietnam Veterans mm -hmm. Memorial. Yep. And it looks like the flag's entering the school, but it's a, that's actually part of the memorial, and they don't have any say over that. Their, their flag is actually around by the office door. And that's the pole, that's the pole there. We only have one flag pole out here, so there's no confusion there for us. Um, well, actually, we have a second flag pole that's used for sporting. Uh, That's down by, down, by uh, down by the field. Down by the field. So, and those are the same two flags. Um, it does not fly a flag except during sporting events. So it it's, 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 it's only American flag. What do we put down by the score? Put up the American flag for games. For games. Yeah. So it gets complicated in a hurry. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, I would also can I also offer because I had heard some of the discussion. Um, so I went and did my research on the flag code, which is um, there, there are uh, codes about how to fly the American flag and what circumstances to fly that um, that go along with should you choose to follow. There is no flag police that says um, that you, you know, there's any problem. But there is certainly a code that is given to flags and how they're flown on um, any institution, um, public, private, they all have their own. Um, Who sets this code? So it was actually set by Congress, but it was it is not law. It is just a uh, recommendation, advisory tradition. tradition. I you can find, you can find it in the New York Public Library desk reference. It's got all the rules laid out. <laughs> I would um, add to what Carl said that about 12 years ago, I served in another SU where someone wanted to fly another flag and the ACLU got involved. Um, and I think we're in a different era now, so don't hear me that that's the same, but my experience is once you start a policy about how you make selections, then you don't have a way of saying no. That, that's really my concern. And so, we do not have a policy right now. We do not have we do one. Not have one. So that doesn't mean you can't, and you, you, know, you, you could. Uh, but I just, that's my only apprehension as your superintendent, is that we're thoughtful about doing this. I agree wholeheartedly with the, with the sentence where the students are coming from. I don't want to say, I'll say it very publicly. I agree with what they're, where they're coming in their request. I want to make sure that we have a good way. That, as we think about the day, Adrian, you were saying earlier that the board thinks about policy and thinks about how do we do this the right way. So, we're solving I'd like to end it in the school's attorneys, just as Carl's. There's three main attorneys, three or four main attorneys in the state for all all schools. Um, and then Julio, we many of us know Julio is a resident in our community here. Um, there are different opinions on this. There isn't one solidified opinion about whether we have the right. Exactly. <laughs> so I just want to, you know, to me that says board. Yeah, you know, we can get you if you want. We use the same attorney that Montpelier School District does. So, so does Montpelier High School have a policy now? No. They acted. They decided they were willing. That given the important, that, that um, I'm trying. To, I want to get the wording right. But Michelle spoke to me. She said that she and the new, the chair of the new Michelle's the chair, chair Montpelier. Uh, Roxbury, no. Uh, well, Roxbury, well, but Roxbury. there's there's a new there's the a new chair for the merchant name in the district. Getting it. Anyway, there's a new chair for the combined for the combined boards. Um, they both agreed that they, as a board, felt that the 
circumstances for African Americans in our country this time is unique enough, this time always, <laughs> is unique enough that it merited, you know, merited their attention and their action, um, and they were willing to stick, you know, to some degree, I think they sort of felt like they were sticking their neck out because there isn't solidity, you know, they're not getting clear answers to how it's supposed to work. I think they felt that this was an important enough issue that they were willing to stick their necks out. Um, I think, given the mixed information we've got so far, it sounds like we could choose to make that decision a one-time decision and work on developing a policy for how we handle it in the future. Maybe we want to develop a policy before we do anything. Um, it sounds like we could probably say that the flagpole functions at the discretion of the board. I'm getting the impression that we could probably make that argument with the information we've got out there, um, which would allow us to just say yes or no in any given circumstance. But, um, I want to say I'm totally in favor of it. I've got the pen on the back right here. <laughs> but the question of what precedent for future requests we create is what the real issue here is, not whether we're willing to put this flag up today. So I'd like to offer some of them. Um, so I've spoken with uh, Mike McCray several times, um, principal um, down at Montpelier High School. And one of the things that I think is important that he stressed is that this wasn't, um, this wasn't the initiating event. This was more of a culminating event. So when the flag was raised after after a year in which the students the students first brought the issue to them, um, and then they their leadership team attended uh, three days worth of uh, training around anti bias and um, and there were several different things, but anti bias was the was the biggest part of that. Um, and then their whole staff uh, went through um, in-service that was dedicated to equity, um, including student-led sessions for teachers. So that all occurred prior to the flag being raised. Um, and so there, were, and so there, were, but the um, the bigger discussion as a whole, um, they've been working on racial justice down at Montpelier High for about three years. Um, so this was a process that occurred over time um, for them, and they felt like they were ready for when the flag was raised as opposed to it was something that just occurred um, uh, in, in isolation. Um, so there were a lot of other activities that went into training staff and working with staff and students and, and bringing up um, equity issues, um, bias issues, and all of that prior to the flag being raised. I, I want to say whether or not we find a mechanism to put the flag up, the important piece of it is the dialogue that we have within our community, and that's in, you know we we're not going to be the ones driving that. That's going to be that's going to be you guys. That's going to be you know that's going to be here in the school, not out on the flagpole. Um, and I I just want to you know I think I think I can pretty safely say that we're all on board with that conversation occurring and, and happening, and that we'll do our best to figure out what we can and can't do with the flagpole. I have the, um, I happen to say from, it was the world paper, the um, speech that the student at Montpelier did, and what impressed me the most is what Stephen just said, that, that it was, it was a two or three year process of engaging the entire school in this kind of talk and understanding, and I heard you talk a little bit about the kinds of things that we can do at U32, and I would encourage you guys to really take the bull by the horn and start to do those things and work with the administration, with the students, so that this does become an entire school-wide thoughtful understanding and process because it's unbelievably important. Um, and you guys are just the, the tip of the iceberg, you know, but you have the power to kind of spread it and make the understanding much better. And I agree whether, you know, whether we, do this and then make a policy or make a policy and then do it. I think you guys have a lot that you can do to make this a better environment for you guys. Matthew, it's nice to see you here. Hi, thanks. Um, I hope you'll continue to have that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't come here to speak to this issue today. Um, and I, I'm speaking as a parent. Um, My son is 10. Uh, he's dark-skinned. Um, a 
around the end of 2016, uh, he was told by a classmate after the election that uh, someone was taking power who didn't like brown people and that he was a brown person. And I think that the um, implication of that remark was that he should be concerned. And I can assure you that he took it that way. Um, so I just want to say that um, I appreciate what you're saying to these students, that they have a responsibility um, to do as much as they can to kind of advance their cause. Um, but I think that the board, too, has a responsibility. Um, my son, maybe, will be in this school in three years, maybe. Um, and so it's of great interest to me to know like, what the position of the school is. If the position of the school is, he heard in, in the school setting um, that brown lives matter less um, and that he should be afraid. And I'm wondering if it, the position of the school is consistent with that or is consistent with the message of uh, Black Lives Matter. Um, so I just would encourage you to think about it that way. And I'd, I'd actually sort of be, I would ask for a stronger statement of commitment, I guess, to that principle. And that the, the statement is that the board intends to do something. And I would, I would argue also that um, simply because flying the flag is symbolic, uh, that doesn't mean that it's um, not powerful as a symbol. Um, it's a statement of, of principle. Um, so not to, not to disregard it as an action that can be taken. Um, so if there's a commitment to find a way to do that or to do something visible and strong and um, clearly stated, and then to state a purpose to figure out if you have to figure out a policy to do that expeditiously um, and as a priority rather than as a two or three year thing that you're hoping to figure out. So, thanks. I think, I think what the students are trying to do here is terrific. I think that they are, instead of trying to use the flag as a culmination, they're trying to use it as a catalyst to start the conversation moving forward. And I really think that I'm really on their side on this one. Um, it's, it's really important. And I do hear the racist comments on a regular basis in school. And it really disturbs me. So I really think that they have they're on the right track. And I think as a catalyst that this is something that can really positively affect the U32 community. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I just wanted to respond to what you were saying about, um, you know, kind of putting responsibility on the students. I don't think that's fair to the students. I think their presence in the school, their diverse in the school, I don't think that's their responsibility. I think that is the administration, the teacher's job. Um, my children have had to deal with comments every year. And um, I have one at the school now, and I have another one that'll be coming up in a few years. And we've literally had comments every year with every kid at all of the schools they've been to. So my children will sometimes disagree with somebody in a respectful way, and sometimes not respectful, because we all know how teens can be. <laughs> Um, but it's not their job to correct people and tell people what is ignorant versus what is racist, what is fact, what is fiction as far as history goes. I think that's really not their job, you know? Yeah. So I, I think I would like to see um, the school be more involved in promoting diversity and teaching them about what the Black Lives Matter is and what it isn't. I want to be clear. I, when I was speaking to the flag versus the effort in the building, I realized it came out a little clumsy. As I said, I did not mean to put the responsibility of it on the kids in this room. I, I think it is us as a community that has the mandate to improve the world we live in. And I just wanted, I, I'm excited they're here. I'm excited this effort is occurring. And I want them to not work, I don't want them to get bogged down by the silly challenges of bureaucracy around the flagpole. You know, I, I, want to make, I want to make it clear that we want to see this effort continue and we want to see, we want to see the, the, the environments will be welcome, welcoming to everyone. Stephen, do you have thoughts about specific things the school could do, kind of in light of what you said, 
Um, yeah, so do I have thoughts? Yes. <laughs> um, so um, I, I think Cassandra is exactly right. This is not the student's responsibility in any way to, to make the change happen. Um, the change needs to happen so that they can feel the same level of comfort, respect, whatever that, that feeling is that they have that, that's not, that is not the same as those who have privilege. Right um, in the school, um, so I think some of the things, you know, we've started down the road, and it's a slow road, right? It's uh, we we have restorative practice as a way for us to begin to build trust and, and communication in our school. Um, we started uh, to become more trauma informed as a staff in terms of our training, which helps us understand both um, both real and perceived trauma by students, and um, and it helps us think about what we're going to do. We have done very little uh, training around anti-bias, um, developing a culturally sensitive curriculum, doing any of those kinds of things. These are areas that we just have not focused on as a school. Um, and, and to be quite honest, it's easy to do in Vermont to avoid that conversation because Vermont is predominantly white. Um, and so, um, so that's, but that's the very marginalization that we're trying to avoid um, in this piece. Um, I, I can say it better, and I, I asked Mike if I could, could share some of his stuff with you guys. So, so this was Mike McRae's statement um, in our conversations. He goes, I've learned so much from this experience. I might have been lukewarm on the actual Black Lives Matter movement a year ago. He says, I'm now squarely in its corner. America is an incredibly racist place, and Vermont is no exception. The white privilege, fragility, and systemic racism are more visible to me than ever. He says, I have no regrets about it, though it might have been the hardest thing that I've ever done professionally, and do think other schools should push themselves on this topic. I'm not saying that all schools should necessarily fly a Black Lives Matter flag, but I think they should find their growth edge and then move past comfortable. And that statement alone, I think, is what we need to figure out. Where is that uncomfortable for us so that we can grow, so that we can create a school culture that is inclusive of all students um, and, um, and certainly helps us identify our ignorance, right, that some of our students and staff have around race issues, around many issues that our students face, um, but particularly around race, because I think it's very, it's was one of the most <coughs> visible things. It's also one of the least, um, uh, what's the thing? Race is a hard thing for people to talk about. It's the scariest conversation to have, is whether or not race is, is um, something that we're going to discuss, because people automatically assume that, that racism, that, you know the saying, right? I'm not a racist. I know somebody who's racist, but I'm not one. Yet, some of my own actions may very well be racist because they are institutional. They are, you know, hereditary in some ways in that where we grew up and, and who we were around, and we don't recognize those things. So I would say that what's most important for us is to develop anti-bias training it's to, to give our students voice so that their, their stories can be told, so that we can learn from them. And the next big piece, and this is what I'll get to you guys to share with you at some point in time, the, what Montpelier was able to do is compile the list of resources, mm -hmm. of videos, of testimonials, of workshops, of what white privilege looks like and to start sharing those with each other so that they can then start to identify their own bias, their own cultural, you know, unawareness, if that's really the word. But I think that that's our job and I wish I could say that, you know, I can snap my fingers and we fix the problem, but I can say that as a school we can build in training, we can build in um, awareness and we can start to support our kids so that they feel like they have their voice and that they have the ability to do these things. I don't know specifically what we would first bring in. Um, 
there are good programs out there that help uh, address some of these pieces. Um, and then there's certainly um, the need for us as a staff and students to come together and decide what's best for us and what's the best process forward. And so I would say that, you know, we've got a lot of work to do. I wish I could say here's the starting point, um, but, you know, that we'll figure it out. Well, I think what's important to note is that last year we did have the Peace and Justice Center in because mm -hmm. we were searching. Of course, we need health care. Mm -hmm. um, and they met with a really small group of students, but out of that came the idea that we needed an opportunity for students to be able to meet. And that's where BLAM came from, is from voices that were perfect in that piece. And I think the staff also had a really small training, not nearly enough, that day. And it wasn't the right fit for us, and we kept looking. So I went to the, a World of Difference training this summer, looking for that, and their training for students is almost exactly the same as our restorative practice training, mm -hmm. except that there's the anti-bias piece in there. And so it's, rather than buy a whole program, how do we already incorporate that into what we're doing? And so I'm excited that we have these resources, I'm excited that you're going to work with the eighth graders. I think that's really important because they want to know, like, what's they're studying this civil rights movement, and some of them are like, but stuff's still happening, and some of them are like, no, it's not. We had a black president all over, you know, and you've probably heard people say that it's not over. And so the the opportunity you have to share with them that it's not over, and here's how I know, is huge. And I know that if I talk at them, or one of you talks at them, huge difference. Mm -hmm. And so I'm so excited that we're all being able to work together to keep working on that, to build those resources, and, and to work with our, our staff, and help you to work with students in whatever way you think is gonna be best. I think we're gonna move forward, and I'm sorry that it didn't happen even sooner. So I think we as a board have to decide whether we want to fly the Black Lives Matter flag as a catalyst to get this whole thing going, if we want to do it and then figure out a policy, if we're comfortable moving that way, or if we want to hold it off a month and see if we can pull a policy together by the beginning of May. Can I just add a couple of things? Um, just along the, the, the resources piece, I don't know if you guys have looked at the Southern Poverty Law Center, if you mm -hmm. guys have. They have some resources. And then just one other quick thing. Um, um, you know, 50 years ago today, Martin Luther King, Dr. King was shot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're still talking about these things now. And so one of his great quotes is, justice, justice delayed is justice denied. So we have an opportunity not to delay justice. You can just say, let's put the flag up tomorrow, and you guys start working out how we can raise awareness in school. That's my feeling. We, my understanding is we don't have to have a policy. If we need to talk to our lawyer, we can talk to our lawyer and get their opinion. But we have discretion as to whether or not we want to fly it. I say we do tomorrow or as soon as possible. Um, and if we want to just create more bureaucracy with another, with another policy, sure, we could do that too. But that's not what I see. That's not what I think is the way to go at all. I think we show support, and we show it soon. I think you have a couple. I agree with you 100%, and I feel like um, talking to the middle school and including the younger kids who are going to push the conversation when we're done would be huge. Like, because I know when I was younger, I dealt with the same exact things, and I have little siblings who deal with it just as much as I did, and I feel like knowing that the older kids are there pushing the conversation would mean a lot. I just wanted to say, like, also as soon as possible, like, Tian and I were seniors, so the more you push it back, the more we're not going to be a part of it. And I just think, you know, before I graduate, I would really love to be a part of this experience and be a part of that movement for our school. Um, based on the fact that the best information we've been able to get in the last few years, 
Um, it appears to me that we probably have the authority to decide what goes on that flag. Um, that said, I'd like to make a motion that Good. we put the <laughs> Black Matter flag. Whether we do that tomorrow or whether we set up a ceremonial occasion for it, maybe up in the air a bit. But I think we should get it up. Hold on, just let me get a second and then I'm. Is there a second for that motion? <laughs> Did you get the motion, Lisa? <laughs> you want to type it up? Well, uh, yeah. no. <laughs> well the, the, before, before we finish tightening it up, are there pieces of that that we feel we need to answer before we vote on putting up the flag? Do we want to decide how long it's going to be up first? Do we want to put it up now? And should we choose to take it down later, do so then? Or do we want to predetermine when it comes down? I, I don't necessarily think we want May to. May I suggest just a point of order? We've got a motion on the table in a second. So uh, you have a lot of great questions, but you can solve those in discussion. Yeah, well, that's okay. what I was okay. so yeah, just going to say. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So figure out, read what you have, Lisa. I have Carl Whitkey moved to. Black Lives Matter flag. Time to be determined. <laughs> Do you want to add that or not? Sure. The time to be sure. determined. And the time and method to be determined. So are you okay with a second on that? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to get that in. Go ahead, Devante. I think that we should make it, like, if we do have, like, a ceremonial thing instead of, like, just out of nowhere, that we should um, have the younger kids involved with that, or maybe, like, during a callback when people can reschedule to come watch it, but not force on everybody. And I think maybe the feeder schools that would come here when they're older, maybe be able to see that, and maybe the group from Montpelier who did that at their school. It sounds like you thought about this a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other discussion? I would just let the board know that this is um, its a bigger issue than U32. We've been, and Monty's right, we've been seeing this at, and uh, Matthew's right, we've been seeing this at the element and have been working to try to, as Steve so eloquently put it, you know, where do we start? You know, and it's been an issue for a, a couple of years. And so um, I would want to echo not only it's not only a youth care two issue, it's not only a Washington Central issue, um, but we're here about those two places. May I also offer um, that uh, I would I do have a fear, right? I, I I need to go ahead and place that out there is that we have a diverse community that is both educated around this matter and not. Um, and so um, I, I would ask that the board at least consider that we need to, we have work to do before we start to raise the flag so that it's not something that is, that creates a backlash immediately, right? It, there's, there will be backlash when it happens. We understand that and we accept that. Um, but we also need time to prepare our own community for this kind of event. <clears throat> Working with the kids to talk about what's right. Devante, you've got some ideas already, obviously. Um, but I think just the opportunity to work with them so that it's done in a way that is meaningful, um, educates others, and that we have the ability to at least prepare our school for, um, for the discussion that needs to occur. We have the vehicle to have discussions. We have RP. We have TAs. We have ways to do that. We just need to be able to prepare for it. Does that sound reasonable to you? Is that sort of a vision that you have for this? I'm the mom, by the way. What, what would you do to prepare students for that? Because I came to this school about 18 years ago. I happen to be Native American. Dealt with all the same issues. Not as much, but touching your hair, mm -hmm. asking different things. So this is clearly not just a Black Lives Matter thing, but like, what, what do you mean prepare? Because you're not going to change people's minds. No, I understand that. Um, that's the long term goal is the education, right? But um, I would say working with this group to actually have this statement about what it means, why it's being placed up, 
how can we have that conversation so that all students are aware that it's happening? Yeah, um, the Black Lives Matter Vermont chapter comes and speaks at schools. So if you that you might know, be a, that that excellent out themselves. So, so the, just for being able to do a few of those things, so that it's not something that just occurs without knowledge, right? And you know, I want, yeah, and and I want I want their message to be clear to everybody when it's raised. And so it just takes. It, I'm not asking for years. Like I, that's not what I'm asking for. My next question was, what kind of time do you think we would need to? Um, I know that's a tough question to answer. <laughs> Yeah, because we have another break coming up as well. So, um, how often do you guys meet? Once a week. Weekly Wednesdays. Um, I would. Is it fair to say a month? Is that fair? I mean, I'm asking you guys. Do you think we can pull this together in a month? I just want it before I, that's, <laughs> that's what I'm hearing. That's what I'm hearing. My kid. Work? Yes, I'm fine with that. Is that and, and then it may be it may be something that we do as a ceremony for a limited amount of time and then say we're going to continue and then maybe something along the lines of what um, Montpelier has decided that it flies during um, the Black History Month uh, during that time period, February. And I would be very comfortable coming back to the time period. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. you know, maybe we write a policy, maybe we don't, you know. But I think it's okay to say, this is my opinion, that we can fly this flag Let's get it up there. And we're leaving it open ended right now. Hmm? I I think we do need to write the policy. At least we at least need to try. I, I feel I feel strongly. Like Before I I think so. Well you've got a month. <laughs> <laughs> Is uh, communicate a little bit. I, I think. Yeah, yeah well, that's yeah, right. We, we have a whole yeah. community that has no idea, basically, that we're, we're even considering this. That's and, exactly what I was um, The other thing I just want to say is that the, the, you coming these last two weeks is actually one of the most um, uh, meaningful things that has happened to me on the school board. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate yeah. it. Um, and I think that you have shown leadership, and we need to respond with leadership. So I think that we should think more broadly as a board. We've asked other folks to do things. What can we do in policy or resolution or some sort of statement about what, what we believe this school represents and, and should be doing? Um, and, and I, I, we need time to do that. I believe that will be stronger than the motion. Yeah. Because that will, that your policies the board's policies is what drives the work of the system. And, and it'll outlast and, 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 people around and, the table. And, and, yeah, mm -hmm. it will outlast the individuals. It's not an individual piece. So, Corey, I'm ask you. Actually, oh, maybe I will. Would you be willing to take a stab at that policy? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Watch you and I work together. I think there's some research. Did, did you have some, well, I was trying to start. I don't, I don't have something right this second, but I there are avenues to go down to. Yeah. And I'd be willing yeah. to work with you. So, so if just, we can bring something yeah, just to, yeah. to look at uh, our next meeting. Yeah. So we is there more discussion? I just want to say I think that um, we're all supportive, um, but we'd rather do it right. Mm -hmm. Do it once and do it right. I think that we need to support our administration um, so that it does get done properly, um, so that it works for everybody. So the motion on the table is to, will you read it exactly? It, it's just to put up the Black Lives Matter flag in a time and method to be determined. Are people ready to vote on that? Could we get duration as well for that? Do we want to put? Is that time? Does time mean duration? So a duration? Time? I think so. So the time is when we raise it, though. Correct. So you're talking so about length. duration. Right. So, if, for example, yeah, I got each February for the month of February. How about with the specifics to be determined? Correct. Sure. That's with the right. specifics to be determined. Is that okay? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, we got to figure out yeah. whether we're going to buy the flag and make it, you know. Oh, <laughs> There's all kinds yeah. of details around. You're we'll, saying we'll instead of in a time, <laughs> method, we would change it to with 
specifics to be determined. Okay, so take that, out the in a time and method and correct. put in with specifics. Yeah. You okay with that? Yeah. Yeah. You okay with that? Absolutely. Okay, we're not running <clears throat> time meeting here, will? Mm -hmm. Are people ready to vote? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So we're going to work with you guys on how to make this happen, all right? Yeah. But neither one of us is here on Wednesday of next week, so we'll, get we'll, some thinking and we'll be right in after. We'll have some questions. <laughs> and you're welcome to go or you're welcome to stay. <laughs> We've done a really good part of this week. Go do your homework. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
we've never built them into the calendar. We've always said that there is a day that school ends, 180 days. Yeah. And any snow day is added on to the end of that. Yeah. For as long as I've been on the board, that's the way we've done it. People may have understood that they were built in, but they aren't. They're added on. Does that make sense? Back when I was here, we never had this kind of problem, and we've always had winters here in Vermont. Well, I think that we're getting, people are getting way windier about driving the snow, in my opinion. Well, the last snowstorm we had, I was going sideways down Town Hill yeah, no, and four-wheel drive. I, I understand what the driving is there. I've got it. It just, these are the things that we're going to start to look at, and I want to be really clear because those are the things that come into this, or, you know, and we can't for next year change the calendar, but it's changing the school calendar, and we have to do that with five super meetings. I mean, this is a lot more complex than all the moving parts. So changing graduation for seniors um, still wouldn't affect. It gives me more flexibility, George, and then where we can. No, this is what I'm trying to clarify okay. with, yeah. your, with your statement and, and your dates. Yeah. Um, they, we could, they could still graduate, and underclassmen could still continue. So they, we need 175 days. Right. This year, we're already going to continue with the underclassmen. We'll get to 180 days for elementary schools yep. by my county, and I'm being, I'm being very careful in using those words. Yep. My county, we have 177 days for all students for right. new 32 because of the way we run some of our operations here. Mm -hmm. So that we can change. You know, we, an example: we start up with three grade levels one day, three grade levels another, but not all those kids are here both those days. Sure. And we do that. We have a day in January. You know, it, 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 it's those types of things. So today, this year, which was a relatively snowy year, yeah. more snow days than. It's the most I've ever been at that call. Right. By your calculations, we're currently 177. So if we have three more snow so days. This year, yeah. for the seniors. 175 days oh, the day graduation. We're right at it. We're right at it. Okay. The other kids will go. They'll go the next, the next week. I would also offer one of our days wasn't a snow day, it was a wind right. day. Yeah. Just, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah incredible. It was. Weather. Yeah. <clears throat> so for next year, you're looking at a graduation on the 21st? On the 21st of January. If you push it back, if I push it back another week, otherwise it'd be the 14. Sorry. <laughs> I understand because I hear from my daughters. I have to ask the question now. There are no good, great options with this. Um, uh, I mean, I think the main principle is that. These weather days are called for safety reasons. So I hate Excellent. to think that you're trying to calculate, you know, well, seniors graduate on time when you're trying to make these decisions at four in the morning. I don't that's, want you to. Yeah. So we, <laughs> it does seem like we probably need a little more flexibility if that's if that's what's going on. And whether we deal with it on the front end during the year or on the end, I don't know what the best thing is. And you're feeling that the state statute calls for seniors to also have 175 days. It doesn't say anything about seniors. It says all students will school, 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 school year for 175 days. Can graduation be moved after, say, once we've, we've had a set so, so it should, and in this, and I'm, the only word I can think of is tradition, or maybe patterns of better ones, it's not so strong as tradition. But the pattern has been in U32, and I this when I came in for Michelle Suchet, who's been on the calendar, working on the calendar for years, is that graduation for next year, which usually was announced two weeks ago when we used the calendar, I purposely took it off mm -hmm. to have this discussion because I was not going to put my put us back in the corner that we've been in without having some discussion. I'm not asking you to tell me what to do. I'll make that because of the safety piece of car. I'm not trying to put you as a board, but I do want a temperature take of. Should I be thinking about pushing graduation back, or should I be thinking about different ways for things to be operating in U32 so there's not this pinch? Mm -hmm. 
We're, we're thinking about making the graduation date more flexible. I can make it now. There are some schools in the state, and it makes it hard on seniors' families mm -hmm. that they don't know what to know about now when they announce when graduation is going to be. That right. seems too late for me. And, and I understand that because yeah. there are many folks yeah, sure. that when my daughter's graduating, my, my sister, I hope she'll be here, and she's going to be coming across the U.S. So yeah. my plane tickets two months ahead of time is going to be really expensive, and she'd rather do that, I would think. Sure, it's earlier. Yeah. And I get that. I mean, it's a big event. It's our culminating event. Mm -hmm. um, and people need to calendar all that. I'm going I respect state statute. I also think about seniors in June <laughs> and whether really two days makes any difference whatsoever. Anything. Except anything. Um, I'm just being realistic. I mean, they're, they're probably checked out about now. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, seniors in April is a, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's a new reality here. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, no, we've all, we've all been there. We're all seniors. Like the end of the year versus the beginning so of the year. So this is why I'm asking for your input. Yeah. If you said to me, Bill, keep it where it is, I'm going to be talking with my colleagues to my right here about how they operate the school. Because I'm going to say I need a little bit more days than just 177, and 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 that's what I'm going to be talking about. 220. 220. <laughs> I agree. That's, <laughs> that's not going anytime. See you guys vote for that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> but I mean, those are, that's kind of the play. That's the temperature. I'm so how are people feeling? Leave graduation and let the administration figure out how to yeah. Yeah, how I feel to like work. I'm, Third week of June is pretty late. Um, I, I would be in favor of rolling the dice next year and think about what you can do for the fall. I mean, you know, I'll I'll make sure we can do some things. I think our community would be more open to starting a couple days earlier than going yeah. a little late. Yeah, I think, I think probably probably much more, less shock. A lot less shock on our community, I think. Or, you know, I don't know. So you don't think I'm going to stay off. Yeah. So, okay. so right. Well, we're done. Yeah. Uh, it's some operational things that we do in New Thirty Two, and we're going to yeah. talk about that. Okay. okay. Yeah. Are I don't need to figure out the calendar. Are I just need to know. That? Yes. I need to have. Letting them that. keeping yeah. graduation the second week in June and let and them figure out the problems earlier than that. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Is that what you needed? Yep. Thank you, Cardi. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Cardi, what an evening. I know. What an evening. Uh, no newspaper report. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they trust yeah. yeah. They do. Um, they do. Yes, they do. They actually do. They'll call two days after work and oh, say, "Bill, so there's some things that happened in the so I can write." Uh -huh. <laughs> Lucy and Shannon, do you have anything you want to say? Student report. Nothing really happened. In the past two hours. Nothing happened now, but it didn't happen like the past week. I mean. School on Tuesday. Well, you did. We didn't have <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there's we had very nice There's one of the days. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, we don't have anything to report. Okay. We just want to listen. I'm really glad you were here. I think that was a really important conversation. Yeah. Right. 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 So, yeah. Um, how, how is the social justice group working with the uh, Are they? I would say I don't know about that. I think the social justice group is a big thing right now with the walkout. Yeah, that's what they've been dealing with and doing continued dialogues on that, but I'm sure that they would be open to working this way. Yeah, I, I think like I think by either like all the clubs are great, but there's just more communication between them. Like I'm sure many clubs would be in favor of this, there's just not they're not talking about like, how they go support each other. So I don't know how that would happen. But. We're actually seeing a surge. I mean, I don't mean to step. Oh yeah. You guys are saying, but but we're actually seeing a surge in student <coughs> engagement around a lot of these things. I, I mean, you see, there's more students that are involved in something right now, but the coordination between groups is minimal. You know, so it's uh, and and that's understandable. They're all kind of in their own little, you know, cubicle right now doing their stuff. But I think now and as as we start to mature with some of these clubs, I mean, Seeking Social Justice is new, Blam is new, 
Um, these, as these clubs start to now establish themselves as, or, you know, as organizations within school, we can start to coordinate the activities a lot better, and, and students can work together on, on similar issues. It's just there's a there's a lot of newness right now around student voice, which is exciting. Um, but it's it's also you know like herding chickens, as you guys well know. Right? Said, well, I would recommend that they do what Matthew does, which is attend every one. <laughs> Scott, you're not sitting next to me. I don't. I don't recommend it. That's <laughs> a good one, Matthew. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Surprised. Some of them are not as interesting. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure we heard you. So back to consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of 32818? Got a second. 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 Jonathan, any comments or changes? I thought they looked good. I noticed one here. Oh, Lisa, what did you notice? Well, I think I had assistant principal listed twice. I don't remember Bill Dice's name. So. So oh, I, I director. Just, it's it's Bill Dice. I got that. Well, and I guess I had a question. The, the teacher that was speaking. So Kristen B was the teacher. Is who her is, name on here? Oh, it is. Okay, yeah. there. Yeah. Who's the, yeah. She's the uh, that's advisor for. That's. I just wasn't sure when I looked at those names. None of them rang a bell for her. But thank mm -hmm. you. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. That motion carries. Um, residency hearing we're coming back to access to course selections we've done black lives flag we've done implementation plan do you want to do that as, separately or as part of your report oh well it will be part of my report I don't have a whole lot else to tell you okay. the admin report. Um, but uh, I do have a handout for you just to, to give you a little little info here so the implementation plan if you guys remember I forgot to actually bring my copy of it but um, it lays out three strategic objectives. Objective number two is the uh, comprehensive and balanced assessment system. That's what we just did a piece of. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. And so, um, so I pulled from the from the actual implement, implementation plan. Go ahead. Yeah. This. This is on the agenda because it was part of our board calendar yeah. to make sure we kind of got to all of our goals. And one of the goals was to learn about the implementation plan. Sure. Sorry. No, no problem. And so the, the objective is that we have a comprehensive and balanced assessment system it, because it's necessary to ensure that all students are progressing towards the mastery of the student learning outcomes and that are, that are necessary for the student to graduate. So we, um, we have data to monitor student progress, plan appropriate instruction, provide enrichment intervention, and plan programmatic resources. Um, so I put down there some of the academic data that we currently can track, right? So I kind of kept this around the academic piece. The first list there, the SAT, PSAT, SBAC, STAR 360 Math and Literacy, and the Read 180 Reading, these are more standardized testing. Um, then we certainly have, and we can review student scores by course, standard, and performance indicators. So we have the ability to look at how students are doing in their individual courses, um, both by course scores and by standard or performance indicator scores. Um, so, so those are some of the data points that we can look at. I would say that um, looking at data that is surrounding the proficiency, so the performance indicator standards, that's very new data. So we have last year's, and then we have this year's, and this year's is even more comprehensive than last because we were able to add to um, what we were able to do. So, um, so this is really, it's not clean data yet. It's, it's, you know, we don't have any kind of history. We don't have any ways to look at that. Where um, STAR 360 now, we're getting several years of data, um, that, which is, uh, this is our, um, screening tests that we give to students around uh, reading and math. It's actually given from grades four? No, from one. Yeah, I wasn't sure how far down it went. Uh, from grades one and all the way up, and we we give it to our, through our 10th grade. Um, did you I take one last, you took one last, yeah. We get that very few performances. We definitely heard about it with our fifth grader, but I didn't hear about it with the first grader. Your first? Yeah, oh, well, that's what I was. That teacher might not be 
as important to the faith day. Yeah. I arrived a little late. And so, um, so we're starting now to be able to use some of that. And I'll talk a little bit about how we use that data. Um, so for each one of our objectives, there's, there are several strategies that we outline in the implementation plan. I put it together in a table with the strategy on the left-hand side um, that we were working on and our progress on the right-hand side. So we really information for some of them. It's not so much progress so that you can see, um, see what those pieces are. Um, so I don't know that I'm going to, I don't think there's a need for me to read every single thing to you, but if you look through there, if there's some questions that you might have about any of the strategies or some of the uh, progress, I'm, I'm going to point out a couple of things I think, in there to give you a chance to look at it. And this will be seven, grade 7 to 12. Uh, in general, 7 to 12, most of our implementation plan is built around the proficiencies uh, and the student learning outcomes. So, yeah, the 11th and 12th grade are not as effective by them. It's aligned with the elementary, as you just heard, to start when we keep going down there. Questions as you first looked at it. There's a lot of stuff in there. Um, yeah. <laughs> 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 it's leading up to a question. <laughs> um, how does it all get synthesized so that when we actually see something that's meaningful at the end of it? So a lot of what you see is when we do the data report. So earlier in the year when we do that report out to the boards and, and Bill does a big bulk of the work for you know the whole supervisory union. The, is it the monitoring? The monitoring, which about? there'll be one in the next meeting here. There'll be one next meeting. <laughs> You're missing a certain meeting next week. Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, so we reported out. This is part of our monitoring report is where you see some of the data. You won't necessarily see the, you know, all of it, but you'll see a, a fair portion of it. Um, and I would point out to two of the biggest areas in this are the reporting part of this to parents uh, and students, um, not just to boards. Um, and that's, um, I think that that is an area where, um, where you see the grading and reporting, which is a second uh, strategy on there. Um, that's an area where we have spent a considerable amount of time and still need to spend a considerable amount of time. It's just how do we report out student progress towards meeting our proficiency standards. And so that's, uh, and that's, that's what we want to work on. I think the other area that I would like to highlight, the positive side of all of this data that we're starting to collect, is the last, um, the last piece, um, the last uh, strategy, which is the educational support team process. So at the SU level, there's certainly a team that's been looking at this. But at, at U32, we have a group of teachers, uh, both a couple of sixth grade teachers, middle school teachers, a couple of administrators, um, special education. And we look at data for all of our incoming seventh graders. So we've already spent time this year looking at their data, historical data. And it helps us plan what interventions we need to, to be prepared for. What kind of, how much reading uh, support are we going to need? What kind of math support are we going to need? And um, we've been able to do, this is our third year to use that data. And we, we do, um, each year we also go back. Um, after about halfway through the year, we look back at what were our recommendations based upon what we saw and how close were we. Like, did all of these kids need this level of support? Did we miss any kids? Um, you know, is there anything that, that we missed or hit 
in, in all of this that, that was meaningful. And we felt like last year we did a really good job of identifying the needs this year, where there was very little movement of kids having to both leave the program because they didn't need it, or come into the program because we hadn't identified them. And so we felt like, and, and a part of it is we just had more data to work with. Um, and so that process, I think, is a, is a real highlight to us collecting this data at the elementary level and being able to aggregate it at, uh, for the high school and middle school. And so that's been a real positive for us. Um, and then I, I just made some uh, some extra bullet points there as what's gonna you know what's gonna need to happen in the future for us to continue to work on this strategic objective. Like what are the areas of need um, for us in terms of resources? Um, I think that Infinite Campus, that's the IC there, is the is our student information system. It's our grading system. It's it has all of that. There's a lot of functionality in this product that we don't necessarily use that could be helpful for us. That requires training. And um, both teacher, student, parent. Um, I'm always reminded, I just went to the conference um, a week ago, and, um, and they remind us every time that the number one user of the program, the, the vast majority of users of the program, are students, uh, not teachers. And so um, helping our teachers create um, good information in IC so that students can do what they need to do is really important. We're not great at that yet. You think, yeah. you, I would <clears> comment, <throat> I'm in some proficiency classes and the way it works in IC is like you have all your transferable skills, but because I'm a junior, it's not converted back to a letter grade until the quarter closes. So it's like a fun little surprise. <laughs> like, <laughs> I get in the class when the quarter ends. Yeah, is that kind of pleasantly surprised or? Usually not. <laughs> so why is that? Though is that because the teachers don't have enough time to? No, I think that the, I would say that the number one reason why it's not being fully utilized is that we have not had a good comprehensive training around using it um, in a while. Um, we do just enough to where teachers can use the basics yeah. of um, the grade book maybe what I think called the message center, there's a few pieces, but there's a lot of functionality that would help teachers. Um, and so we're, we're gonna be developing some additional professional development for our teachers at the beginning of the year to really use the product better, because it'll make their life easier. Really, if they know how to use the shortcuts, yeah. right, instead of trying to do workarounds, um, it, it'll make their life a lot easier. So is there one person on staff that could maybe develop a shortcut cheat sheet? Yeah, we have lots of those. Okay. That we are, so we have two teachers that we pay as um, coaches okay. for this, and they work with our teachers all the time. Um, Michelle Sepka out of Central Office is a, is a huge resource. Michelle's been pretty much dedicated. I mean, so we're not waiting around for some you know, private yeah. consultant to show up. No, 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 that's, no, that's fine. Perfect. No, we're building the yeah. capacity in-house. Yeah, and that's why I've, been, I've gone, this is my second year to go to the their conference where it's, it's training. Yeah, I and mean, we, we sent a team of an elementary educator, high school educator, uh, Stephen, um, usually a, one of our elementary principals has been leading this effort across the district, and Michelle Sutton. Yeah. And U32 this year, Stephen's not saying this, but it's, it's being identified nationally as some of the good work that's going on, the proficiency work and the use of IC. Yes, so we're leading some of the curve right now. In so we get the calls from the developers, so the ICE, the Infinite Campus corporate development offices to say, okay, what do we need to do um, to make this work for standards? Because we've made a lot of noise, but we've also, we lead the way. We, we, we've made some, we, we have been working to develop our own tools in some cases, and the next update, one of our tools is right in the product now. And that we developed kind of independently because they're like, yeah, this is going to work, and it's, yeah. it's I mean, nice. And it, it doesn't matter what student information system here. We could have talked about these are the same issues across the board yeah. with the student information systems that are accessible in Vermont. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't yeah this, this isn't a, the, the, the 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 learning curve on this is the same for all of them. Um, I think you guys, Power School, and Alpine team. Or, yeah, Alpine <laughs> has, had, has had big issues. I mean, everybody has. It, we can go to Jumpstart, we can go to any of them. 
Yeah, I would point out the next bullet on this, um, on the where are we going to need, need to commit resources is um, how do we align those outside assessments to our SLOs? Do, are they aligned to our student learning outcomes? And can we say that by performing at a certain level on some of these assessments, you demonstrate proficiency of some kind? Yeah, you know, we, I think that this is a, it's a big, big question, but a really important one for making these outside assessments much more uh, relevant to our students. Um, and so if they knew that you're taking the SBAC test and you could show proficiency in math in some way, yeah, yeah that's great. Now there's side of it or, or, or yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so that, that yeah. yeah, so those are so, so those are some ways that we need to do. Um, can SBAC help? I just does SBAC can that organization help you determine the alignment with the SLA? Well, they publish all of their information about you know how their problems are aligned and, and those kinds of pieces. They're not going to. They're not going to come help us. So they we're, have, we're Vermont. But we're, they we, have. Don't, we don't. We don't have enough. We don't have enough dollars to get us back to even look at us. Yeah. Um, so we'll. But, but they do publish the materials. We just will have to do the legwork to make it match. Right. Um, and, and then the last bullet up there. Yeah. Um, Cut my eye. <laughs> that you like, I figured that would. Actually, that was the, that was my Scott uh, moment. Thank you. Um, we move a tremendous amount of data through our um, supervisor union as a whole now. Like as we collect more and more data, how we pull that back out so that we can use it to make decisions, it just becomes more and more difficult. So having somebody who has the training, has the ability to um, to develop more tools, so we can develop a lot of different ways of looking at data. Um, but this is. This is a wish list, <laughs> but, uh, but I think that having somebody who could really help us develop that kind of stuff would be important. So this would be an SU kind of? It already is. is. It, it is. I know it is. It's a different, it's a, it, he's going somewhere else, which I know where he's trying to go, but it's uh, <laughs> push it. Yeah. It's, um, most student information systems take two or three different types of job level professionals. We are so small that we couldn't hire three full-time people to do that type of work. Mm -hmm. Michelle Supka is great at what she does. She does a great job of organizing the data, making sure the data is in the right place. Uh, she is daily increasing her skills. Absolutely. But a good example is she's not a SQL coder. We probably need a SQL coder for like point four, point five. Because you got to build, no matter what's in a student information system, you got you got to have someone's computer program on the backside. That's the way databases work this day, these days. We need somebody that's just a network database guru. They're not the ones programming it, but they're just making sure everything is running fine on the backside. And these are, I mean, these are when I just said that to give you an idea of what the price point is for someone who's really good at SQL quoting for what we need. We're talking about eighty thousand to a hundred thousand dollars salary position. Half time? No, no, full time. Full time, time position. We're talking, you know, and same for the database networking. You want to make money? This is this is where people are making their money in IT land. And you go to pick pick whatever IT company you want. This is what this is what's really happening on the back end. So is it not feasible to? Um, to figure out this position and then maybe bring on board another Central Vermont school. So the, to share the other point six or point five. It, I, George, I've been trying to do that for twenty years of my career. When I was an IT person, it's really tough to do. Yeah. Okay. It's really tough to do. So um, we're trying to. And and this wasn't meant as a slight against our ability to do this, but this is you know the reality. The reality. Yeah. 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 Um, and because I mean, we'll talk. I mean, Baltimore County school yeah. system, Baltimore City. city, city. Sorry, Baltimore City school system. How many developers do they have? I don't know, but there's a lot more than. So and they they developed the same dashboard that I developed, and of course, there's just prettier and it runs faster, and it actually doesn't have all the bugs in it that their mind does. But it was the same dashboard, so I I so what it is is I I went to them and said, all right, can we share some of this like. I can't, I don't have the time to go. I'm a high school principal. And she's like, oh, I'm in charge of the data department. 
right? <laughs> you know, and so she's got you know multiple programmers, multiple yeah. people working on this. And so you know, if I can find the places that will share, and the, and people are very generous at this conference about sharing your stuff. And, and it gets back to I mean, here's the example. Great, we can work with another school system, but they don't have the same SLOs, right. and they don't have the same proficiencies. Right. So they don't have the same assessments. And they don't have the same assessments. So you got to think about it. It's not really the data IT piece. It's more the educational side that's got to get along. Yeah. yeah. That was that was my, my that's my dream list. Someday maybe. Look forward to Santa. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Any other questions about? This is a quick update. Is, is this helpful? I, I mean, I, I want to so that yeah. in the yes, future, very like I, I don't want to, I don't want to do something that's not at least helpful to you guys in terms of what's going on. That's good. Okay. Will we be able to use this um, sometime in the near future to um, deter scheduling problems for the following year? So once we know proficiency of students. Let's just say, yeah, yeah, I see what you're asking on that. So once we can better track proficiency, yep. yeah, we can probably do some of that. Um, I, yes, we could. I think that we're also, when we start having discussions about school start time, school day, some of those kind of things, opens up more opportunities. Our schedule is extremely tight the way it is right now. I think that we're going to start having some, we're going to put together a group of people to start looking at how do we build a proficiency schedule not a credit schedule, which is what we're living in right now. And that might provide us more opportunities, more unique opportunities for kids. We're moving in that direction. You know, I'm curious because I don't, I don't see it getting easier with greater population and more teachers that you know, they can see going the other way. That's why I'm just curious. It's kind of a crystal ball. Yeah. Play. Yeah. I would say what this does do, that's kind of a tangent to your question, George. It allows us to personalize more. The more information we have, the easier it is to personalize. And personalizing to me isn't, yes, I want to help every individual kid, but I want to be able to say, what are their delight groups of kids that are interested in the same thing? And having that information will make it easier to say, so then how do we adjust the system to serve? Yeah, personalized, not individualized. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Board observations is next. This is just a friendly reminder to myself also that part of the monitoring system we've tried to develop, one of the pieces is a board observation piece. And when we go to, yeah, I mean, we yeah, should, and we should, you know, we used to, when we, we had those student presentations at the beginning, we would pull out those board observation forms and just kind of mark down what we noticed and what we saw. Um, so it's just a plug when you go somewhere pull it out and just note it and we've gotten more, we were doing it better before. And then there were a bunch of letters that we saw briefly last week from students, it looks like, um, was the democracy class, what, what's that class called? It was help me. Yeah. We got letters from students about oh, yeah. climate change yeah. Yeah. and so there are a whole bunch in here. Some of them are in ninth grade, so they're global studies. Global studies. And I think somewhere from the yeah. democracy, what's the democracy yeah. close to? Democratic groups. Democratic groups. Democratic groups, that's it. Um, if anybody has any comments or they're just in there because they were sent to the board. There's some interesting ideas. There are some interesting ideas, and I love that the kids are. Yeah, me too. So you were their authentic audience. Yeah. yeah. They didn't yeah. write the letter. Yeah. I, I think we should reply. I was just going to say, should we give them a reply? Yeah. Would you like to reply? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I am really good at that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I give you for compliments this week. You know. Thanks. That would be great. Scott, you I'd like you guys to come down really hard on spelling and punctuation <laughs> and, and cross-checking their facts. <laughs> you need to get the end. Okay. Appreciate the effort and the thought. Um, thank you, Scott. And if you want to pass it by me, fine. If not, yeah, no, 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 no. I totally trust you. Reports to the board. <laughs> Central Vermont Career Center. We just have to say it. Just say it. <laughs> 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 
Students said no. Administration, do you have anything I else? Just, I just want to add one thing is that we're in the thick of hiring right now. Um, so we've, um, we've, had, we've got several interview committees that are running right now. Um, we've already seen uh, our social studies candidates have taught, and we're going to be uh, forwarding our candidates on the bill um, for, for those positions. And we're, we're moving along. We should yeah. add, add the, there are special educators as well. No, yeah, that's right. We have two social studies openings? So we actually have two social studies openings. Um, and a science? Two science and now. Science. Um, you'll be accepting tomorrow. Um, we didn't do that last week, right? We didn't accept any jobs last week. So we have a resignation for you tonight. So we did resignations. Did you last time? We did resignations. So they got, we didn't no, do they got jobs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, they got those last week. I'm sorry. I wasn't, yeah. you know, I was bopping around all over. Yeah, you missed that one. Oh, all right. And so, um, yeah, so it was two science, uh, math, and, uh, no, we're missing one, Stephen. Yep, yeah. okay, look at these minutes. Yeah, okay, we'll get to that. Yeah. And we got several, but they're all in process right now, so you should start hearing about appointments soon. Next month, I think. Yeah, very soon. Yeah, we'll get some. Finance, page 18. Nothing's really changed there. Same as last month. And the finance committee has not met. We have not met. Okay. Does anybody have any questions on that? Summary page? We're still in healthy shape. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, we ain't. Yeah. We're not too healthy. No. Okay. Pretty healthy. No. Well, there are needs. There are needs. That's why I'm in the capital budget. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. there's a few places. Yeah, give us uh, another money to come back to you. With. Okay. Or two. Executive committee has not met since last time. And policy committee? It's not. It's not. Okay. We did meet last week. Can, um, do you guys know when your next policy meeting is? We're trying to schedule that right now because Berlin shifted their school board okay. meeting. On top of the policy change, so there's a Google poll out okay, that you saw that said, "When are you available <laughs> during the month?" Because we're going to replace it. Yeah, I mean, really, any well, 4:30 is not a great time, but so a little well, later. We're gonna... Just if you, I know, I know that went out, so hopefully you were yeah. on that time. Okay. Um, we did the Black Lives Flag vote. Do you, so do you have an end of year resignation? Um, yeah, I guess it was in there. It wasn't in the minutes. I just looked. I didn't see your it name wasn't listed. last week, yeah. Yeah, we so we need, we, need, we need to give it down. Yeah, okay. I don't have it in front of me, but I know what it says. Right. Um, so Pauline Cheeseman was our um, one year, um, well, actually, she was a two year, year that's why one year at a time, yeah. Uh, um, appointment to fill Randy's uh, leave of absence. Uh, she and her um, partner are moving out of state. So I know they moved here in the state. We got her for one year and they decided to move on to New Hampshire. Um, so she's respectfully submitted a resignation from that position. So a motion to accept Pauline Cheeseman? Pauline Cheeseman. Excuse me. Motion. 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 George and a second. That. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. No appointments yet? Not yet. Done. We okay. don't have board orders, I take it. Yes. Yeah. 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 I totally missed it. You guys are great. The motion to accept the board orders? I'm good. Got and a second. Carl? You want a number? Yes, please. 38630 dollars 29 cents. Okay. Any questions on those? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Further agenda items? We've got accessibility we will talk about. Anything else? We got lots of um, Just a reminder that the board retreat is May 23rd at my house. It's a Wednesday. Thanks. We start at 6. 
you set goals, students don't usually come. <laughs> it's not very far away if you want to drop in. Yeah, that's true, you see? Right in the corner. <laughs> Um, board communication. Well, since Kari's not here, I guess I get to write this one, huh? <laughs> I'll write the front porch forum one. Um, did you write something? What were you going to write? And I read it? No. Both, <laughs> both of you. You were going to give me something. No, I, didn't actually, plan. But, I did not, but we can, again. But you were going to do something there was about. Another piece to run. Hold on. It's in here somewhere. I think it was the, the land burden. That they made a request. And then there was another piece on proficiency. Where did that I know that I owe you something. Yeah. Oh, you were going to write, you were, yes, draft something about Blaine and Black Lives Matter. Yeah, that was me. Yeah, yeah. Jody. But there's something else I owe you, I believe. Yeah, something so, about the implementation plan. Yeah, yeah. Just the sort of the, the distillation. Of yeah. It. Yes. <laughs> so you don't give it to me, and I don't like it. Um, I think we should write something about what happened tonight. Yeah. And I can try and do that. Can we try and do that since I gave other people work to do already? Okay. That's true. So I'll do that for the newsletter. And I wonder, could I get a copy of what Leticia, was that her name? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What she said? We can have her send it to you. Yeah. yeah. If she's willing to. Did you get the newsletter that just went out? Did the board get those? Yeah, we, we, I, I got it. I didn't get that it. That makes it the best yeah. I need to get it as an email. Yeah. Or, instead of looking I just for it myself. Because I'm not over that. <laughs> Yeah. Give those to Stephen so I can take home. And I'll write front porch for him. Okay. So I think we can adjourn. And it's no. No. Oh, we have to go to executive session. We do it. It's right here. So you guys can go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. Hope you enjoyed yourself.